morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome Dilip, who needs no introduction, but for that, maybe one person that doesn't know you, Dilip, uh, Dilip heard up Nomad uh, at World Bank, but more importantly, I think, really the one person that has his pulse on what is happening with all the migrants. So Dilip, thank you so much for your time and welcome to this uh, podcast, I guess. Um, so Dilip, you've just released, um, interestingly, the data regarding remittances. And I think it'll be great to, you know, we've all read your publication. I know you've been doing a lot of interviews and webinar, but I wanted to get your firsthand sort of um, explanation and reaction to the data. So it would be great if you can share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, there are some surprises from the latest data release um, on remittance flows worldwide. Uh, we monitor data, as you know, uh, remittance flows and migration flows on a daily basis. Uh, actually, you could say even on an hourly basis. And uh, uh, yet we were surprised at the resilience that we observed in the data. So remittance flows proved to be way more resilient than we had anticipated. So they fell only by 1.6% in 2020 to $540 billion. And that's only $8 billion lower than the 2019 level, which was a record level to start with. So right. that was the big surprise. Uh, and that's the headline number. Um, which means that a quick dip in the second quarter last year and kind of recovery after that, and uh, the recovery would continue. So looks like in 2021, we would break out of the negative zone and there'll be a positive growth of 2.6%. And perhaps next year as well, there'll be a growth of just over 2%. Yeah, I mean, great, uh, really encouraging news, you know, given what we've all gone through and experiencing. Um, but I wanted to just go back, Dilip, I remember when we, you know, spoke back in April and when this thing had just started, um, we were looking at a 20% fall. I think that number was pleasantly revised back in October to sort of 7, 7.2% and now 1.6. So while I think it's, it's great that the impact has been as, as little as 1.6, um, what were some of the reasons that there was such a big variance, acknowledging that you know, this is a pandemic and it's so difficult to forecast in normal times. But what, what would your thoughts be on that? So uh, exactly the kind of uh, question that I would have uh, uh, liked to pose, which we, we, we were posing and we have answered in the uh, report that we have put out. The report is called Migration and Development Brief 34. So it's the 34th in this semi-annual series which basically means that I have been doing this for 18, 19 years now. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, so in, with, with that long hindsight, um, the V-shaped recovery uh, is, is really surprising. Um, again, to put things in, in perspective, and I'll come to your question right away. Uh, you know, in 2009 global financial crisis, I remember kind of um, uh, sticking my neck out, as they say, like this, and, you know, waiting to be chalked by anyone, including perhaps the senior management of the World Bank, um, for going out and saying in 2008, before the 2009 global financial crisis, that remittances would not fall by much. Uh, and at that time, we had the reasoning that uh, migrants uh, try to help families, and that is what will actually cause the uh, flows to be much more resilient during 2009 global financial crisis. And sure enough, 2009 remittances fell 5%, and then 2010, they were already higher than the pre-crisis level. 2020 COVID-19 crisis was way bigger, larger, deeper, more broad-based, more uh, intimate. It, it reached to household levels, right? It separated family from family members. Uh, it was that impactful. So we were expecting all uh, sort of all bad things to um, to hit remittance flows and migratory flows to disrupt the flows uh, and the surprise is that the the recovery which initially we were thinking 2020 a 20% fall maybe a 5% recovery in 2021 that was our april forecast remember we made that like before the end of april right in October, we realized that this, you know, Q3, Q4 
the data were already getting a little better. So we said, okay, it will not be like a 20% fall, 5% in improvement in 2021. It would be 7.2% uh, fall and another 7% fall. Right. In the end, it would be the same sort of level, so it is gradual fall. Now what we see is 2020 second quarter, a sharp drop more than 20%. Mm. And in many, many countries like Bulgaria, 86% fall. Uh, in many, many countries, it was 40, 50% fall. Right. And then surprisingly, the V, the, 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 the deep point of the V became very narrow and it was a quick recovery in third quarter and fourth quarter, and it has continued into the first quarter of 2021. Mm -hmm. Again, the surprise there is the counter cyclical um, fiscal policies, the cash transfer programs that, that were put in place in a, on a massive scale, the employment support programs that were put in place on a massive scale, the largest host country in the world is United States, and you know that's an example, but it happened all over the world. And that was the surprise that no model could predict, right? Because it's a political thing, it's, an, it's a question of ability. And that, by the way, remains also a risk that we cannot forecast going forward. So that 2.6% increase this year is subject to whether the counter-cyclical fiscal policies, right. policies will have steam or not. Yeah, yeah. No, that's um, that makes sense. But I think just let's dive into this 1.62 because I think while it's very encouraging and, and sort of, you could almost say sort of flat to the previous year, but there's a lot of variations sort of by country, right? So, I mean, I think if you look at perhaps maybe outside, you touched on the US where clearly there was a big stimulus package. Uh, I think another one announced just yesterday, but um, you know, if you look at Gulf, which is the next sort of second biggest sending, and then the recipient markets for Gulf are the Indian subcontinent. So India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, you've got Philippines, you've got uh, others too, um, and we continue to face crisis in India and surrounding areas. How were those countries impacted? So, uh, just to to uh, elaborate a bit on the variations that you mentioned, that in some parts of the world, particularly Latin America and the Caribbean, there was a six point five percent increase in remittance flows uh, in 2020. Huh. And in Mexico, which is the largest remittance recipient country in the LAC, Latin America, Caribbean region, uh, there was actually no decline whatsoever during the entire year. It looked like a normal year. So there were a few countries and few regions where remittance flows held up reasonably well. And then there were other regions like Europe and Central Asia and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where flows actually declined by about 10% and about 13%. And in countries like Nigeria, remittance flows declined by 28%. So there was clearly a lot of variation. So the impact of the crisis uh, was there, even though there was resilience because migrants continued to support families and their willingness to support was somehow uh, enabled by counter-cyclical fiscal policies. Within that, there were major impacts of the crisis on oil prices. And oil price is a major driver of remittance flows from Russia to Central Asia region and from the Gulf countries to South Asia in particular, but to Southeast Asia as well as North Africa region. And oil price impacts um, on um, remittances were felt deeply in the Central Asia region, but also in, uh, uh, in, in South Asia region and Southeast Asia region. Uh, there was a decline uh, in many countries during the, the second quarter. And then we had some very uh, unusual effects, and but those are one-off effects uh, that had little to do with the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. Mm -hmm. And that is what confounds the picture. So one might become very optimistic and forget about the downside risks. But the fact is that those were one-off factors. For example, uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca was uh, canceled. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in 2019, 1.8 million people visited Mecca. Now, these are mostly, uh, you know, all kinds of people, but uh, mostly the majority of them are uh, migrant workers and their families supported by the migrant workers in the Gulf region. When the pilgrimage was canceled because of travel uh, bans and worries about COVID, uh, all that money 
from those millions of people was actually sent home uh, as remittances. So that actually affected remittance flows to countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. But then you had also Bangladesh uh, experiencing flood in July when almost 87% of the land mass of Bangladesh was inundated. Mm. So that confounded, uh, that resulted in a large amount of uh, uh, remittances coming into Bangladesh, but that is a one-off thing. And that confounds the picture. Uh, and it seems like, oh, Bangladesh is having a great time in terms of inward remittance flows. But the question remains, will it dry up going forward? Uh, the Mecca factor will be, play out again this year because we know that travel is not allowed again uh, so far. No. So that would be there, but the um, other one of factors will, will not be there. Overall, in the Gulf cooperation countries, uh, there has been a structural shift in employment of foreign workers. And what we noticed, uh, and the, the data are actually shown, showed in the, shown in the uh, Migration and Development Brief 34, between 2017 and 2020, the number of foreign workers in Saudi Arabia alone declined by 3 million out of a total of 8.5 million. Uh, you can imagine that's a structural thing. Uh, this is a structural policy induced factor uh, in their efforts to increase native uh, employment, employment of their own people, mm -hmm. and, and discourage employment of foreign workers. That means millions of those workers are coming from Bangladesh and Pakistan and India and Philippines and Egypt and Lebanon. Uh, they will not, uh, will not find jobs in the future. And that leads me to an important point that 2020 marked the first year in the last 70 years history of uh, migration flows for which we have data that the stock of international migrants actually declined. And 2021 seems to be set to experience a further decline in the stock of international migrants. This is the first time in the history. So while on remittance flows, we have reached one after the other two milestones on migration, we are also reaching two milestones in, a, in the opposite direction, but with much longer uh, implications going forward. Yeah. So it is worth um, remembering ourselves, uh, reminding ourselves the two milestones on remittances 2019 was the first milestones when remittances exceeded foreign direct investment flows to uh, low and middle income countries. In 2020, because of the crisis, foreign direct investment fell by 11%. And if you exclude China by 30%, which was our projection by the way, mm. um, remittances declined by only 1.6%. And because of that, in 2020, a second milestone was reached when remittances, excluding China, remittances to low and middle income countries surpassed the sum of foreign direct investment and official assistance uh, together. So this is a major uh, turning point in the, uh, in the trajectory of remittance flows, means that remittances are no longer small change. They cannot be ignored by the global community and yet much remains to be done to facilitate these flows. So efforts must continue to keep remittances flowing. And um, the money transfer uh, industry has a huge uh, challenge to rise up to the need of so many millions of poor people to keep serving them. No, and your last point is very interesting, Dilip, in terms of the actual reduction. I hadn't appreciated that. and. But what I was going to ask you, which actually now you've just validated, is that I keep reading, I can't remember if it was Bloomberg or Economist, somewhere I read about the shortage of labor, you know, as this recovery is happening and minimum wage is shooting up and people can't get, I mean, we're, I think it was in the US, but I know we're experiencing the same in UK and Europe and so on. And with the, because a lot of the migrants have gone home, you know, for one reason or the other. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in India or South Africa or Brazil with this continuing sort of COVID, you know, I just wonder at what point do we see those people coming back or do we see them, as you said, nationalization programs are kicking in and so on. And this, this really changes the long-term dynamics of, of remittances. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, if uh, migration uh, is mostly economic migration in the sense that people are, this is not refugees. You know, if you look at the total number of migrants, um, refugees are only about 4% of the total. Uh, so 96% or so 
of the migration is motivated by a desire to find an employment abroad. Now, you know that when people go to the Gulf countries or they come to the UK or to the US, uh, if they don't find a job, they will go back home because the main reason they come to these countries is to be able to work, escape unemployment, earn money, and then send a whole lot of that back home so that the families also back home will have something to uh, survive on. That's the that's this right. story of remittance flows and migration flows. In that process, migrants stay in foreign countries only because the firms and households need them and they employ them and then they pay them in exchange for work. It's not charity. It's, it's a, it's a market-based solution. The migrants provide work, the employers and the households uh, use them. Right. If they are not there because they have gone back home because of the crisis, then the mothers won't be able to go to work. They will not have childcare. Schools will be empty because there will not be teachers. Farms will not have workers and managers, but I'm more worried about the workers. And we have seen the role of migrant workers in the frontline workers, uh, in, in the frontline of the fight against COVID. Not only the doctors and nurses, uh, think about the IT workers behind the scene facilitating everything, yeah. but also importantly, the storekeepers, the grocery store uh, clerks, the delivery uh, people, uh, they, are, they are there on the forefront risking their lives. That's why the community is safe. So that process, if there is a structural change in that process because people are afraid to, because they have gone back and they're afraid to come back, or even worse, people are worried about risks of whatever from migrants and they, they, the sentiment against migration turns uh, more negative. Right. Right. And that begins to impact policy. And suddenly there is anti-immigration policy everywhere. All the good that the migration does in terms of increasing the supply of labor, the skill set of labor, uh, fighting against the front lines, yeah. all of that will act in the reverse way. And that is a huge downside risk to the economic outlook going forward. I think that is way bigger than um, the downside risks that come from the cash transfer programs, fiscal stimulus programs drying up. Because remember, remittances are about four or five times larger mm. than all official aid put together. So there is no way that that huge uh, force for good that comes from migration in terms of contribution to the GDP of host countries. And in terms of remittances, the contribution to the, their countries of origin, if, if that whole process is somehow uh, disrupted because of the changes that brought about by COVID-19, uh, that would be a long-term risk for a long time to come. Something to, we, we need to worry about. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think this is why it's important that this stays right at the front and, and initiatives like Call to Action that I know both you and I participate with, led by Swiss and UK government and others, is really important. So, um, Philip, you, as always, I know you and I can carry on for hours, but I, <laughs> I've already taken more time of yours than, than I promised. So thank you very much. Look forward to getting more and more data and, and nobody has a better, you know, their fingers on the pulse than you. So. Thank you very much, Dilip, for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit. It's a pleasure talking to you, as always.